which you would find it helpful to have your Bible open this evening because we will be referring to it frequently, consists of three stories or parables which Jesus tells, highlighting certain truths about an extremely difficult and uncomfortable and I suppose naturally in so many ways unwelcome subject, the subject of the last judgment, the day of reckoning, the end of time, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ as the judge of all the earth. The first section in chapter 25 verses 1 to 13 is taken up with the parable or story of the ten bridesmaids, the ten virgins, five wise and five foolish. The second, verses 14 to 30, with the parable of the talents and the three men who were given different talents by their master. And the third, from verse 31 to the end of the chapter, with the parable of the shepherd. That is the rather less familiar and certainly the less comfortable figure of the shepherd because Jesus tells us that the shepherd is not only the one who comes to seek and to save the lost and who lays down his life for the sheep, but here he presents us with the picture of the shepherd king who separates the sheep from the goats. In verse 32, before him will be gathered all the nations and he will sh separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Each of these three sections also speaks of a dramatic crisis. First, the coming of the bridegroom in verse 6. And that is the occasion which alerts those who are involved to discover precisely who they are and where they stand with the bridegroom, bridegroom in the things that really matter. The second, the return of the master to reckon with his servants. In verse 19, after a long time, the master of these servants came and settled accounts with them. And the third, the great separation at the coming of the Son of Man in glory, verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then will he sit on his glorious throne and he will separate them one from another. Now there is no problem about discerning what it is that Jesus is speaking about or what day he is referring to. He is referring to the day of his personal return at the end of time when he will bring the history of this world and this present age to its conclusion, when he will call down the curtain as it were on all that is happening on the stage of the world's history. And when he will summon the whole of mankind to appear before him and hold his last assize. And Jesus is speaking about the day, the great and awful day of the Lord of which the Old Testament speaks, the day of his return in glory. Now each of these three stories you will notice also tells us about a division that will take place on that day amongst men and women. In the first, in verses 10 to 12, five of the virgins are admitted to the bridegroom's presence and five are excluded. In verses 21 to 23 and in verse 30, we discover that two of these men who have the talents enter into the joy of the Lord and one is left desolate, cast into outer darkness. And in the third case, we discover that there is a division made between those on the right hand and those on the left of the king. 
And you will see that in the light of that, it is utterly and totally impossible to take the words of Jesus seriously and to believe that in the end of the day, God will make no difference between men and we will all get to heaven by our own particular route. That may be at least superficially a welcome thought, understandably so. But what I want to say to you this evening is that it is a total variance with the teaching of Jesus. There is just no possibility of mistaking what Jesus is saying here. When he comes again in glory, there will be a revelation of his true nature and ours and a separation which will be absolute and final. I say to you again that there is no possibility of mistaking that truth, uncomfortable and difficult though it may be and it is. We cannot take Jesus seriously and come to any other conclusion. Now it's important for us to make our way through such a chapter as this and such teaching as this and I want simply to be your guide through these solemn words of Jesus this evening, which I think have three great principles in the first instance to set before us. You could call them three great warnings, which the Lord Jesus powerfully sets before us in the light of his coming again at the end of the age. They are, if you like, three great notes of warning which Jesus issues to us not just to people in that age and that day but to us this evening and if we would be wise men and women we will pay heed to these warning words of Jesus we dare not you see just accept his comforting comfortable words we need to accept his warning words and Jesus never uttered them to hurt us, but to save us. And the first is this. And I want to say to you that none of us dare this evening say, this is going to be a word for them, for other people. I have an idea the kind of people that he's going to be talking about and talking to. My dear friends, I would not take the wealth of this world in my hand and opt out of hearing for the sake of my own soul what the Lord Jesus is saying in these words. And the first warning that he issues is this. It is that appearances may be deceptive. Look at these ten girls, for example, in the first story. All of them are similarly dressed. All of them are similarly described. All of them are similarly occupied. All of them have heard an invitation. And it appears that all of them have responded to it because they are all here waiting for the bridegroom to come. And to all intents and purposes, and certainly to all appearances, you would conclude that they were all in the same state and condition. You would conclude that these were people who were truly the bridegroom's call to attend, the bridesmaid's call to attend to the bride. And that they would go into the wedding. But the thing which really mattered, on the day when the bridegroom arrived were not any of these outward things. It was not their dress. It was not their outward behavior. It was not what they conformed to in terms of a general pattern. It was not that they had all heard the summons or all appeared to respond. What really mattered on that day was something inward, hidden and secret. And that was the possession of oil, or the lack of it. And it's not difficult, is it, to see Jesus' point. Indeed, this may well be the climax 
of a great series of warnings that Jesus issued again and again throughout his ministry, may I say to you again, beloved, in God's name be ready to hear it. He warned that one of the most dangerous conditions to be in was the condition of the hypocrite who acted a part and put on an appearance and convinced everybody except God. And when Jesus sometimes warned, sometimes pled, whatever you are like, he says, do not be like the hypocrites, for for a pretense they do this, that, and the other. They had all the outward trappings, even of zeal. But Jesus says to them, Woe to you. And it is possible for us never really to have discovered this truth that appearances may be deceptive and that we may wear all sorts of outward garments. But when the day comes, and all outward appearances shall be stripped away from us. The thing that really matters is the secret hidden truth of the real man or woman we are in our hidden hearts. And that was the problem for these five foolish girls. That's the first warning. Appearances may be deceptive. Here is the second. Confidence may be misplaced. You can see that if you look closely enough at all three sections of this chapter. Let's begin towards the end. In the last of them, in verse 44, for example, those on the left hand of uh, the king are amazed that they should be rejected. Then they also will answer, Lord, when did we see thee hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to thee? They can't understand it. They are amazed because, you see, they were absolutely confident. Now, Jesus touched this area again and again also. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father. For many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, we have prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonderful works in your name. It's astonishing to think that you're not going to accept us. And he said, I never knew you. Never knew you. Confidence may be misplaced. You will notice the man who had the one talent is not really distressed. He comes to the master just as confidently as the others and names him indeed master, he says. I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not winnow, so I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours, he says. Now he's confident, you see. He is going to be all right with the master, as he thinks. But confidence is misplaced. Supremely, it's illustrated in the first section. All ten of these girls slept in verse 5, do you notice? As the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Their sleep was the sleep of contentment and confidence, without a question. They all faced the coming of the bridegroom with confidence, but for half of them, their confidence was misplaced. They were actually suffering from a false sense of security. Now isn't that what Jesus is saying? I have to ask you, is that not what Jesus is saying? Here are these five girls suffering from a false sense of security. Clearly they were 
unaware that it was necessary for them to examine their lives and their condition, or they were unwilling for it. And you see, contentment by itself is not necessarily a Christian virtue. Have you thought about that? I know lots of people who will tell me, I'm perfectly content as I am. Don't you imagine that every non-Christian is discontented, restless, and unhappy? Not at all. There are many people who will tell me, I am perfectly content without God. But the warning of Jesus is confidence may be misplaced. And contentment may just be the sleep of a fool. I am bound to pause for a moment this evening in the midst of these solemn words of Jesus and say to you that I pray, God, that you are not sleeping the sleep of a fool. Because it is possible for confidence to be misplaced. And what happened when the bridegroom came was that they had thought that grace, even if they didn't have it, was transferable or obtainable after the bridegroom came. And it wasn't. They were saying, our friends have oil. But the bridegroom's real concern was whether they had it themselves. And it was discovered that they didn't. And they badly needed to awake out of sleep. Because confidence can be misplaced. My dear friend, what are you resting your confidence in this evening? in the light of the fact that we are inexorably moving to that day of which Jesus speaks, what have you rested your confidence in? Is it in Christ alone and in what God has done in Jesus Christ for sinners? Is that where you have brought all your confidence and all your hope? Have you rested it utterly upon him for yourself? Not because you were brought up in an evangelical home and believe that it's transferable, this grace. Or because you have the outward reputation and other people believe something of you. but because you have gone for yourself to Christ and obtained everlasting life. That's the only confidence that is well placed. Appearances may be deceptive. Confidence can be misplaced. Here's the third warning. It is that judgment is irreversible. You will notice how emphatic this is. There is a chilling note of finality in these words of Jesus. In the case of the bridesmaids, the door is shut and it cannot be opened. They hammer upon it, let us in, but the door is shut and the closing of it is final. In the case of these men with the talents, the verdict is given and will not be changed. 
In the case of the dividing between the sheep and the goats, the separation is final, and those who are turned to his left hand will go away into eternal punishment. It is in the light of all that that Jesus bids us watch and be on the alert because judgment is irreversible. Now that is a truth that we really do need to face, you see. There is no such thing in Scripture as the reversing of that judgment that Jesus makes. There is no such phenomenon as his giving people another chance. The judgment is absolute and final. At the prayer meeting the other Wednesday evening, we were considering that strange story of the rich man and Lazarus, and they both died, and they both departed from this world, the rich man to hell, Lazarus, into the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man, when he is there, he cries and pleads to Abraham to send somebody to relieve his condition. And Abraham, heaven says to him, your condition is irreversible. There is a great gulf fixed between us and you. And that's the voice of God, my dear friends. That's the voice of God. Appearances may be deceptive. Confidence may be misplaced. Judgment is irreversible. Now in the light of that, we need to look at these three passages again to ask what from Jesus' lips are the distinguishing marks of the real Christian as distinct from the professing Christian. Because here is a situation where Jesus is speaking to us about the most solemn issue in the world. And we need to grasp ourselves what is the distinctive evidence, the indisputable mark, of being amongst those who are the wise, the faithful, and those on his right hand. Well, notice there are three tests. There is a manward test, and there is a Godward test, and there is an inward test. I wonder how you would have set down the tests of who are the genuine as distinct from the false in this word of Jesus. Well, here is what Jesus says. First, the man word test. The picture you will notice is of the Son of Man coming in glory to sit on the throne of his judgment in this third section of the chapter from verse 31. And he separates the sheep from the goats as we have been noticing, but the vital thing is the test that he uses. Now, how does he tell which are sheep and which are goats? Do you notice this from verse 34? Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, because, now here is the test, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Naked and you clothed me. Sick and you visit me. In prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you like this? And he says, in verse 40, the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And correspondingly in the remaining verses of the chapter, he says, As you did it not to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it not unto me. What is the test then? What is this manward test? of spiritual reality, of Christian commitment, of real Christian experience, of the kind of genuineness that convinces God, because that's what's important. Well, the evidence that Jesus is looking for is genuine, practical, costly, selfless, 
Christian love. That's what he's looking for. It is the spirit of the one who serves, who gives himself for the sake of others to others for the glory of God. It is that practical outgoing of the heart that is at leisure from itself to soothe and sympathize inasmuch as you did it to them, you did it to me, says Jesus. Now it's important not to be misled by this. You cannot read much of the Bible without seeing that salvation does not come through good works. And you will not suspect me of preaching that this evening, I hope. We cannot earn eternal life. It is a gift from God, and indeed Jesus underlines that in verse 34 when he speaks about, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for me. Now you do not earn an inheritance, you receive it as a free gift. We are justified by faith. But I want to say to you this evening, my dear friends, that on the day of judgment it will be re-emphasized to us as Jesus himself emphasizes it and scripture makes clear on nearly every page that faith without works is dead. And in the eyes of God it is not only dead, it is fraud. And what God is looking for is evidence of saving faith. And where is that evidence seen? In a costly, sacrificial, outgoing love for my brother. That's where it's seen. Now it's a very important thing. For us to recognize that while we are justified by God's free grace, we are judged by our works. That is, let me try to clarify it, that is, when God is seeking to test our genuineness, he will search not our verbal profession, but our works, our lives, as an evidence of our faith. For the simple reason, you see, that saving grace, divine regeneration, never ever leaves a man or woman the same. And there is an awful blasphemous fallacy that has long been abroad in the evangelical world that you can be converted and go on living precisely as you did before. That it is entirely acceptable to say that a man came to faith in Christ 20 years ago but has lived ignoring God ever since and he's a Christian. I want to say to you this evening, my dear friends, that the Bible does not know anything about that phenomenon. And what Jesus says is that he will be looking for the evidence in our lives of the grace of God at work. Now let me make this still more clear. Good works of themselves are no evidence of salvation. There are many people who have many evidences of good works in their life and in their daily pattern of behavior, and it is not an evidence of salvation. Philanthropy is not an evidence of grace. But if you profess to be a Christian... And the marks of true sacrificial love for other people are not seen in your life and character. Then you lack the evidence for which Jesus is looking. And it is aboundingly serious. The language of the child of God is this. I cannot work my soul to save. 
for that my Lord has done, but I would work like any slave for love of God's dear Son. And I say to you, it is this change in our life, this transformation in our behavior, this new dynamic in our character, that is the test for which Jesus is looking. We may not look for it in each other. We may say, I am no judge of my brother standing before God, and I am most certainly not, and neither are you. But I say to you, my brothers and sisters, it's going to be too late to wait for the day of Christ. We need to see these evidences now. And I suppose that the reason that this man would test is so important, and so important a test of reality, is that the real gospel and the real grace of God drives to the very heart of our basic human condition. And what is our basic human condition? I'll tell you what it is. It is a life that is turned in upon self. And the real grace of God touches that and blows it to smithereens and turns me into the kind of man or woman whose real heart is for others. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. Caring for people with the same care that God brought God down from Egypt to Egypt and Christ down to Calvary. And if that Jesus lives in you, Isn't that what we say? That's the Jesus that lives in me. Then, my friends, it will become visible. Here's the second test. It's a Godward test. The second parable deals with the relationship between the servants and their master. And you will notice the vital issue in that parable of the talents. And there are many lessons to be learned from that parable, but for our purpose this evening there is one central lesson, and that is what they were doing for him with what they had been given by him. And the real test on the day when the master appeared and held a reckoning, he was accounting with his servants. It was stock-taking day. And he was accounting with them what they had done with what he had given to them. And the real test was... What was their relationship with him? How were they thinking about the day when they would meet him? What had they ventured and done for the master's sake? It was a Godward test, you will notice, that Jesus speaks of here. And what he's really saying to them is, What have you done for me, not just for other people, but it is for me. Now some of them were holding back through fear. This man at the end is the example of that. He is a man who held back and would not go all out venturing for his master's sake. This is the test of true wholeheartedness, of true diligence, and true faithfulness to the Master. It is, if you like, the test of commitment and the level of our commitment to the Master and his cause and glory. And the servant who took the five talents and made them double, and the one who took two and made them double, he had an absolute commitment to his Master's cause and name. And this is, I say, the test of diligence and faithfulness and wholeheartedness. I would call it the test of commitment, really. Well, now, what about that? Here is what the Lord Jesus is looking for, my dear friends. And it's a test of reality, will you notice? And he says, uh, what have you done with what you've been given 
He is asking about the level of commitment. Now what about the level of your commitment this evening to Christ? I am asking you the question and asking it God knows far more to myself in the light of his coming again in glory. Oh, you say, I am a thoroughly committed Christian. You ask anybody. Ask anybody. Anybody will tell you, I'm known as a thoroughly committed Christian. Well, let me just do a little bit of spiritual diagnosis with you. Will you allow me to do that? It's important for us to diagnose the real condition of our hearts. Let me do a little bit of it and apply this to your heart and life. If you are a thoroughly committed Christian, it will come out. It will show itself, that commitment. And it will probably show itself more than anywhere else in the world in the priorities by which your daily life is ruled. Your home is organized. Your life is lived. That's how the level of your diligence and faithfulness to God is going to be tested. Well now, what are the priorities of your life, my dear friend? How do you differ from godless people who do not own the Lord Jesus in the world? What are the priorities in the way you use your time? In the way you employ your energy? In the way you invest and use your money? In what is first place? In your home and family. In other words, we are really just asking of each other, what is the great issue of life to you? Is it God, really? Of course, you say... But is it really God? Is God the great issue of life? Is his word the great controlling factor? What God says is everything to me. Is that really true? You know it's not really very valuable to believe in the infallibility and inerrancy of Holy Scripture if you don't allow it to rule your life. There's a manward test and a Godward test and an inward test, and with this we finish. The great contrast in the first of these stories is between those who have the outward posture and habit and demeanor of true believers and those who have the inner living principle. And what Jesus is simply saying in that story is that now in this day and then in that day, my dear friends, it's heart religion that he's interested in. Now by that I don't mean orthodox religion, nor do I mean conservative evangelical religion. I mean heart religion. Because it's possible to have outward, as, outward appearances of an evangelical, conservative, reformed, orthodox sort. And yet, it has never really touched home to the kernel of my heart or I would be a different man. And you would be a different woman. And in the Christian life, the really vital things are the hidden things, not the outward public things. They don't matter at all. The name and reputation that we have, that doesn't matter a fig. What really matters is the hidden inward truth that God himself sees this evening. So I'm bound to ask you, do you have Christ within this evening? My dear friend, 
Do you really have Christ within your heart? That's the first question. And here's the second, and then I'm really done. Do you have Christ in his proper place within? Because you see, one day, and it's not melodramatic to say it could be tomorrow, it could be too late to do anything about it. May the God who one day will be our judge speak to us and make us willing to hear him. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we bow ourselves before you. Your word is sometimes piercing and disturbing to us. And yet we ask you that since you have spoken these words, you will be pleased to apply them to our lives in such a way that they may be healthful, and bring us blessing. Hear us, O God, as we open our hearts afresh to you this evening, and even as we sing our closing hymn, pray that in some sense we may have dealings with you through Christ our Redeemer. Amen.